I was living in Manhattan at the time with my fiance. We woke up and put on the television and um, saw the news and uh, we were on the Upper West Side and it was a beautiful day. There was no sense of anything going wrong. If, if, if you didn't have the television on, there was no sense of anything up there. It was, it was, it was so eerie in that way that that the day was so beautiful and clear in the skies. And especially if you were uptown, we were near 80th Street in West End. Um, if someone hadn't told you that all of this chaos was going on, you'd be really surprised. Which is sort of why I. I think that we found it hard to, we're a little in denial of it for a while because we weren't right down there in the middle of it. And when you watch something on the television constantly, it's like you're watching a movie. I mean, is that real? What's really going on? Um, maybe it would have helped if we went on our roof and tried to look. But anyway, so we were, we had just woken up and I was um, supposed to open in a show called Aida at the time that specific day was my opening night and um, and I obviously well I didn't know you didn't know anything what was happening at the time I actually had had um, sort of my career was ebbing and flowing and this was this felt like a lower side to my career I was I had been in rent and I, had, I left rent to have a to make a record and I got this uh, record deal that I'd always dreamt of having. Um, and then that didn't really work out. I ended up getting dropped from the record label. And then, you know, it was sort of, I felt like I was in obscurity um, for a little while. So Aida was sort of the one of the first jobs I got since then that made me feel like I was, you know, part of something again. And um, just got those juices flowing. And just to be in New York City working in the theater, having having been trying to make music and I was writing my own music. It's a very solitary existence to be in a recording studio, just you and a producer. It's it's a beautiful thing and I love it, but whenever I come back to New York and, and do theater, I'm always I always feel so at home and I'm always just reminded of that that's where I feel like I belong. It's it's the community and the the um, camaraderie of the cast and and also the interaction with the audience and all the energy that's being reciprocated. So I was enjoying myself. I was well. I was working. I felt good about that. And I had to dance a lot in Aida, which was not my strong point at all. So the assistant choreographer had to set aside a lot of time to work with me, just to teach me eight counts. Um, and I was doing a very, very girly role, which wasn't sort of my my thing. So um, I think it's the first time I ever wore fake eyelashes and a wig on stage, too. I don't know if that's important. But, um, I think it is. <laughs> that's a crucial detail. <laughs> it's funny. I feel like if, if we're going to try to find the good in the ugly, um, I've had a couple experiences like that. I When I was in Rent, our composer... Jonathan Larson passed away on the first, uh, the night of our first preview, and um, and I don't know what it is, but I feel like ever since that time, and then with 9/11, I've had these experiences that are always there to sort of remind me um, of what matters in life, um, sort of staying in the moment, um, not losing perspective. Uh, with rent, it was you know my first professional job, and we were young twenties, and and we could have sort of gotten taken, we could have sort of uh, lost our perspective, and instead we were given this um, crisis to overcome, and how to be on a stage when when that's happening, and to perform, and 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 to know that your responsibility is to put forward this music and the, these words and this man's. Um, message and so and then it, you know every so often something happens in my life and then a couple of years later there I am about to open Aida and this happens and I guess I was probably self-involved and all I could think about was you know with the eighth count of this and if I'm going to hit this note and whether my fake eyelashes were on right and you know you lose your perspective and um, 
and there's always something as horrible as it was if I'm at least that day it, it, if I could look back on it in retrospect at least there was a lesson to be learned as far as how um, how trivial that stuff is in life and um, I don't know I mean I, I hope it doesn't seem um, insensitive to be trying to extract something good or a lesson from that but it's all you can do to try to make sense of things when they go bad I guess our stage manager he he called us um, and he said this isn't gonna happen today and just stay tuned and we'll let you know and uh, um, and we my husband and I just stayed you know we were just staring at the television for the next two days three days or whatever it was um, and yeah so then I believe you would know uh, um, how many days after that Broadway well, opened Broadway up? Broadway went up, I think, on that Thursday. On that Thursday. Two days late, which is astonishing to me that people could go up and do live theater two days later. Yes. So could you tell me, do you remember getting a phone call saying, okay, we're going up, mm -hmm. and do you remember what it was like to actually enter the theater and, and, and make that happen? Well, you know, first you have your truck to the theater, which was always so uncanny because... Um, I just remember the kindness and in, in everyone as you pass them, the the uh, respect for each other, and the there was just a a gentle quality when people opened doors. You went to get your coffee, or even on the subway, whatever it was. It was just this. Um, it was r rather beautiful. I I thought. Um, People really looking at each other in the eye when you said hello, and you know you cross them on the street. Um, and I just felt awkward being at the theater, to be honest. It just felt like, a, a, should I be here? Should we be doing this? Is this going to seem selfish or self-absorbed that we're here putting on a play when there's so much pain going on around us? You know, um, is it going to seem um, uh, sorry, what's the word? Frivolous. Uh, frivolous, but what's the word for um, just about business and making money and is it commercial? Or yeah, exploitive yeah. Exploitive. Is it, it? You know, I, I felt awkward because you know, it, is it going to feel frivolous? Is it going to feel exploitive? Um, and uh, but I, you know, I went to work and there's a. a great thing that happens as an actor when you're in the dressing room and you have the routine of putting on your makeup and your costume every day. Uh, people are always wonder, they're, they're, people are always surprised that theater actors do their own hair and makeup. And, um, and having been on both sides where, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have somebody dote on me and do a better job than I do for myself, I actually welcome it because it's, it's a ritual. It's, it's a way of getting into character. It's a it's a, some sort of meditation. It's a way of just sort of having some downtime, and um, uh, and I I found that to be healing, you know, for me during that time. Well, also my role was comedic, and which made it even more uncomfortable because first of all, I had I had this is the first day I'm I'm. I was going to be on stage, so I had no barometer as to whether my jokes would land because not only is the audience maybe a quarter full, um, but obviously they're there in a much different state of mind. So <laughs> you have to just get up there and, you know, send that joke line out there, and even if they're not really laughing, you know, you just couldn't judge yourself. Um, and yet I thought, well, if, and they were laughing a little, you know, so I thought, well, well, this is a nice gift to be able to bring a smile to people's faces. And um, that's when I realized the, the strength, the, uh, the potency, the, the magic of theater. Um, because, you know, sometimes it's an escape 
which it probably was in this case. I mean, we were just doing the story of Aida and I had all the funny scenes and it wasn't that serious, you know. Um, so it was perhaps an escape. They could go, they could laugh, they could hear some music, but also it was the camaraderie, the coming together, the unification of everyone sitting in a theater together that I think has an, a healing effect. For both the actors and for the audience, I would guess. Certainly for the actors, I mean, uh, I mean, that's why we do it in the first place. We get such a wonderful energy back just from giving of ourselves and that's sort of intoxicating, but it's even more so at a time when you know that people are in pain and you're actually providing some some kind of catharsis place for them to have catharsis or uh, just just a sanctuary, a haven for them to have these emotions in a dark room, nobody's staring at them. Um, I know that's how it is for me when I go to a play or you know a musical that really moves me. Um, it's, you know, you go, you might go with other people and I'm sitting next to my husband, my best friend, but it's dark and I can have my, my own experience, um, sort of, well, I had been spoiled. I mean, I had, I had been in such a successful show before where every house was filled to the max of, even more than that, I mean, it, you know, kids would come back 20, 50 times. They were screaming. They actually ruined the show for the people sitting behind them because they would, you know, they knew the joke coming and this line and, uh, you know. Um, like Rocky so, Horror. exactly. It could be like Rocky Horror <laughs> sometimes. I remember how empty the theater felt. Even though there were probably 800 people there in a 2,000 seat theater or something. I remember that emptiness. It's scary for a performer, um, um, and it and it was there, but only for a few days, you know. And then little by little, it started to grow. And then, if I recall, it came back stronger than ever. Um, I think that's a testament to the people in Broadway, but it's more just a testament to New Yorkers and. Um, their ability to bounce back and um, the pride they have in their city. It's almost like, you know, we didn't want anybody to, to think we were weak in any way and that we would, we would find, our, we would re rehabilitate ourselves quickly and be the city that we've always been for the rest of the world, you know. I, I, as a little kid, I mean, everyone has a story, I guess, but I used to take so much pride in seeing the skyline, whether is I grew up in Long Island, so it's whether coming over the LIE, it comes over at a very certain height on the um, expressway where you can't see anything, and then all of a sudden you reach a certain plateau and the entire skyline is, is exposed. Um, that used to excite me so much. And, um, or if you were flying back from somewhere and you'd see the Twin Towers peeking through the clouds, my dad would always make me come over to the window and look at that. So I have a really nostalgic, um, very visceral feeling from my childhood about that time. Um, what we do, what I do for a living, it, it, in essence, it makes me feel good. I, I won't deny that. You know, I know I'm supposed to be entertaining an audience, and I'm so glad when I connect with them and I hear how it's affected their lives or changed their lives in some way. But I love it. You know, it makes I I love being up there. I'm I'm levitated somewhere where I'm out of my crazy head and living in the moment for a moment, you know. Um, so I guess I'm trying to answer the question altruistically, and I guess it, it feels somewhat c conflicted because it was, a way of, it was a way of healing myself to be up there, to escape, to 
not have to be completely in my body at the time for what everybody was ex everybody was experiencing out there because when you get up on stage you for me when it's happening when it's working you're just sort of floating and transcending and um and so like i said i just i don't know how magnanimous of a spirit i was <laughs> It's just what I do, you know, and that's, I didn't have any other choice. The night of, um, uh, at the curtain call of the show, on my first night of Aida, um, we came out and then we sang uh, America the Beautiful, which I believe most cats were doing around the Broadway community. And my father was out there, and he was sitting next to my husband, my fiancé at the time. Actually, they got along really well, but they, they hadn't really connected like they have now. And my father, apparently, I'm told this by Tay, my husband, but he just, like, his head, I, I haven't seen him cry very often, you know, his head just went in, the, in between his legs, and he just lost it and was bawling put his hand onto my husband's knee, which they were not that connected or close to each other yet for that kind of moment. And I'm told this from my husband, who felt that it sort of brought them, that it was an intimacy that they had never experienced together and made them closer. But he didn't know what to do. I mean, I, we had never seen my, I'd seen my father cry maybe, you know, once or twice before. Certainly, my husband hadn't seen this, two men trying to come together, but my point being that everyone was, everyone was experiencing that, and it's odd that my father found peace in a room full of strangers to have this cathartic moment when, you know, my sister and I have hardly seen him cry, and what how powerful that is, the, the theater and that experience of sharing in a room together through music really was what it was in my experience. Music speaks to everyone and there's no, um, well I just think that music sort of tears down boundaries between people, races, um, everyone's backgrounds, you know, you can't deny what a song, someone's voice, an instrument, whatever that is. You can't deny that emotion, that the way that it fills your soul and and it just brings people together. I mean, I love it because it's where we're all sort of the same. <laughs>